Welcome to Revelation Ancient Prophecy. This series is a detailed, in-depth study of the book of Revelation. You will discover just how relevant to our day the prophecies of Revelation really are. Here is your presenter, Pastor Baron Neustraten. Well, good evening once again, the book of Revelation. And we are surely but slowly making our way right to the end of the book. Tonight, a very important topic. It really concerns the millennium and uh, we should understand uh, what will happen. And uh, so before we open the word, can I invite you to bow your head as we do invite the presence of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have this privilege to be able to delve into your word. Lord, to learn what you teach us that we may see your dealings, your provisions, your care for not just us, but the whole of the universe, and that we may have a clearer picture of your love for all of us. So help us to understand, to be retentive, and we pray this in the precious name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. And so Revelation, we talked about Revelation 19. I remember that last, uh, last week. It says here that uh, he, he, Jesus was depicted on a white horse. There is a, there is a scene of warfare, if you like, not in the traditional sense, but uh, as we know warfare today, people to people. But this is an intervention, a divine intervention when Jesus returns. And, and so, so John has depicted him on a horse. There is an element of warfare. It really is like this. Jesus comes to deliver his people. You got to bear that in mind. Jesus comes to deliver his people and to execute judgment. And that is true. To execute judgment in righteousness, he judges and he makes war. And so that is what will happen. Tremendous scenes, scenes that you, you can try to describe, but we can't properly depict. What is important is that heaven, as the whole of the universe observes, and when we look at the throne room in heaven, the 24 elders and the four living creatures, they have a doxology. They fell down, worshiped God who sat on the throne. And this is what they said. Amen. Hallelujah. Which means praise God and affirming, affirming the actions of God, particularly Christ in this whole scenario of the conclusion of the end of the controversy here before the millennium, put it that way. Well, heaven approves. Heaven has a clear insight and it has all the information. There has been an investigative judgment. There have been the last seven plagues and heaven looks on and recognizes, acknowledges, and I think this is important, intelligent beings with an intelligence and an understanding way beyond our own, they affirm and confirm the righteousness of God in all of his dealings, his actions, and his judgments. And then John is told this. He said to me, these are the true sayings of God. What he's saying is, this is the truth. This is how it is or going to be. The invitation to the marriage supper, but prior to that as well, you have the sea beast and the land beast at the second coming. And it says here, it said here that these two, that is the first beast, you know, the book of Revelation, the sea beast, the second beast, the land beast, Protestant, upper state Protestantism in general, uh, initially the United States, that great nation. These, these two were cast a life. So they were cast, yeah, this is important to know, they were cast a life, notice, into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. There is, and I know this is hard to comprehend, but there is an executional part of the judgment performed by the one who also saves us. And that is a very important concept. There is a willingness by God. In fact, there is a need to judge. 
and uh, and the rest of the people, those who were support of, of of the land beast, the false prophet, and the papacy, that is the the ultimate driving force of the apostasy, and the rest, that is all of the people who supported them, were killed with the sword. Now you remember the thought. The sword here is described like this, which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. Remember me quoting to you that Jesus said that the words that I speak to you, they are life, true. But the words that I speak to you, they are those who will judge you because it all depends what you do with the words that he has given you. What do you do with it? Now we're dealing with a devastating planet. You can imagine when that tremendous force, you know, I think of the resurrection of Jesus. There was one angel coming, maybe two. And he came and he, he, he opened the graveside and it was an earthquake, one angel. Can you imagine that tremendous power field when Jesus returns with billions of angels, because that is what it will happen. With billions of angels, what is going to happen to the surface, the, the whole ecology, if you like, the, the, the form and the shape, the surface, what will happen to it? The book of Revelation gives some very graphic, very graphic descriptions. We will have a devastated planet. And the word millennium does not, is not to be found in the Bible, but it's basically two words, mila anum, that means really a thousand years. And that certainly is mentioned a number of times. So we're dealing with a thousand years condition of the devastation of this planet. Let's get into Revelation chapter 20. Jesus has arrived. And now John sees this. I saw an angel coming down from heaven. And he says, having the key to the bottomless pit. Key is authority. It is authority. Authority to the bottomless pit. What is the bottomless pit? Well, I, I'll put it to you. It is the devastated planet currently where we are. There's a great chain in his hand. Now, a chain, this is again a figure of speech. I hope you grasp that, because in the book of Revelation, we deal with symbols and allegories. The chain is, a, is a, an instrument of limitation of movement. So he, he has the key to the bottomless pit. He has the chain that is to limit someone's mobility. Notice, notice. He laid hold of the dragon. Now we know who the dragon is. That serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan. So we get a, a strong angel, uh, more powerful than Satan. He gets hold of him. He, he, he puts him on chains. In other words, he is going to limit his mobility. That's fascinating and bound him for a thousand years. That's interesting. For a thousand years, apparently, for a thousand years, Satan and the demons, and the demons are confined to the location of this planet. You might say to the scene of the crime they will have no intergalactic capacity. That's removed. That's expressed by the chain. And in fact, if you, if you keep reading here, if you keep reading here, he cast him into the bottomless pit, that is the planet in its devastated form, and he set a seal on him, a seal on him. Now that's interesting, why does he do that? That he should deceive the nations no more. So in other words, I, I want you to understand this. Satan is confined to planet Earth, as are the demons. It's like a jail. In fact, I'm going to put it to you, it's like hell on Earth. It will be for them. Can you imagine? Can you imagine how the blame game will develop between them? You can almost imagine. So that he should deceive the nations no more. The nations no more. 
Why not? Well, as we will learn, and as we actually already learned, there are those at the second coming of Christ who are alive and those who are not. Some that are in the grave in Christ will be resurrected, and I'll show you in a minute. Others that are in life and in Christ, his people, he, they will be translated. Meet him in the air, we learned that. But it is fascinating that the ones who are dead and have uh, been lost because they did not come up in the first resurrection, they miss out on the whole scene, the whole scenario of the second coming. The ones that are alive when Jesus returns and that are against God's people, well, they will be destroyed. Massive destruction of life. Massive. What I'm trying to say, what the Bible is telling us here, Satan is out of a job. Why? Well, there's nobody to deceive anymore. The, the nations that were against God's people and therefore against God, they are not there. They're dead. In fact, the Bible suggests they're not even buried. Till the thousand years were finished, a thousand years in that confinement will be a very long time. But after these things, that is after the thousand years, after the thousand years, he must be released for a little while. There's a reason for that. In other words, he's going to be released, and while his release will mean he will be able to deceive again. In order for him to be able to deceive again, he's got to have subject, objects to deceive. And he will, because there will be a second resurrection. The second resurrection. We'll come to that. I saw thrones. He now has a view in heaven. You get that a lot in the book of Revelation. There's the horizontal look, what happens on the planet. Then there is a look up into heaven and you synchronize the two events. Now he's looking up in heaven and he sees thrones and they that sat on them. And he says, and he said, judgment was committed to them. That means that which judged everybody is now open to them to look at and to study. Because there will be questions. Why did such and such not make it? What stopped the Lord from saving this person, that person? Marvelous. We will have the opportunity to go through those records. That's quite a, quite a privilege. And so, <coughs> the souls of those, this is whom we see in heaven, who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God. Now, that is the saved of all the ages. And then he becomes very specific who had not worshipped the beast or his image, these are the end time people, you remember the 144,000, and had not received his mark on the foreheads or on their hands. They went through that very traumatic upheaval that finds place just before Jesus returns. Well, he sees them in heaven, those who have been faithful. And they lived and they reigned with Christ... Notice, for a thousand years. Now, what is important is this. Contrary to much popular belief systems and theories, the millennium, a thousand years, the reign of a thousand years in heaven, is indeed in heaven and not on planet Earth. Can you imagine... Being here for a thousand years on a absolutely devastated planet. You couldn't. We go to heaven. And we have many texts, and I'll give you a number of them, that support this. What I'm trying to say here tonight is that the understanding, the correct understanding of the state of the dead, 
is of vital importance. We got to take the word of God very serious. And so, and so, Paul puts it this way. He says, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? We will. Once we're in heaven, during the millennium. Do you not know that we shall judge angels? Fallen angels, not the good ones. We will. We can look into their affairs as well. Amazing. God will grant us that privilege. And then there is a parathetical statement, and some translations don't even have this, but have a look what it says. The rest of the dead, that is the ones that were not resurrected during the second, second coming of Christ, those who did not take part in the first resurrection, that's the rest of the dead, did not live again until the thousand years were finished. And that is true. That is true. Now the next verse, the next verse relates to those that are in heaven. This is the first resurrection. The ones that are in heaven and reigning with Christ. Verse 4, the millennium in heaven. Reigning with Christ, judging. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. Apparently, there is a second death. Unless Jesus returns before you die the first time. There's a statement, and it's true. The humanity is actually divided in two parts. There are those who live twice, and there are those who die twice. You may be laid to rest before Jesus returns, and you will be resurrected, never to die again. The second death will have no power over you, because the Bible says, if you come up in the first resurrection, you will be free from the second death. It can't touch you. But should you be lost and you are laid to rest, that's the first death, then you will be brought back to life for only a short time, I'm afraid. And this 20th chapter gives us a lot of insight. Only to die again, which is the second death. The difference between the first and the second is enormous because in the second there is no resurrection to the second death, as long as you understand that. Let's continue. Let's continue. It says here, but they shall be priests of God. A priest has access to God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. That's a long time. We will be learning so much during those thousand years. Paul said this, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain, that is the ones who are alive and Jesus returns uh, until the coming of, of the Lord, will by no means precede those who are asleep, those who have died. Now you've got to get used to the expression that the Bible teaches that death is asleep. A sleep from which he can be awakened. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, audibly. There is nobody who will not recognize the second coming of Christ. It'll be so powerful. With the voice of the archangel, there's only one archangel. Arche in the Greek, in the active sense, is the one who is the cause of all the angels, who created all the angels. Who created all the angels? Michael, the one who is like God. And so, with the voice of the archangel, the voice of Christ, there's only one archangel. With the trumpet of God, remember the trumpets, we dealt with those. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Now it's interesting that the dead in Christ will be brought back to life first. That's important that, that we see this. Can you imagine what the scene would be like when you see people? Maybe that's the time you should be at a, 
a massive cemetery and see those who come back to life. That would be amazing. Then we who are alive and remain uh, shall be caught up together with them where? In the clouds. Now note this. We are not going to meet Jesus as he walks this planet when he returns the second time. In fact, Jesus had a lot to say about that. He said, if they tell you, oh, he's here, he's over there. He said, don't go there. Why? Because it's not me. It's not him. Don't go there. We meet him in the air. As he left, he will return. This is what he said. That's what's been taught. And Paul knew that and understanding this, he proclaimed it. He said, we will meet him in the air. We meet him in the clouds. Note this. <coughs> to meet the Lord in the air, not, not on the surface of this planet. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. We will be inseparable. Fantastic. That's marvelous. Therefore, comfort one and another with these words. Now, that is a tremendous comfort when you, when you have to farewell loved ones. And that is so difficult. When you do, you have to. It's only for a time if they're in Christ and you are in Christ. We shall meet again. And so there's a comfort. Behold, he says, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Not everybody will be dead when Jesus returns. There will be people that are alive. But we shall all be changed in a moment. Now, I want you to see this. He says, we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Wow. At the last trumpet. So if you're old, elderly right now, you will suddenly in the twinkling of an eye, you will regain your more than the best youth you have ever known. Isn't that something? Transformed in the blink of an eye. That's incredible. But that's the promise. It's the promise of him who created everything. The whole of the universe. He can do that. And he will. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. When you come back to life, if you were laid to rest before Jesus returns, you come to life with a body that is incorruptible. Not just an improvement of your current body. <laughs> no, 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 no. A perfect body. So perfect, you've never known it like that. A sense of Feeling a condition of well-being you can only dream about. Oh, we have a lot to look forward to. No question about it. So the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. He's emphasizing this again. Remember, in the twinkling of an eye. That is what the Bible teaches. He says, and correctly so, for this corruptible must put on incorruption and, and this mortal must put on immortality. You know, we come back with a body that can last eternity. It's meant to last an eternity. And so this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible uh, then puts on incorruption, he says uh, this mortal has put on immortality then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory death is already defeated because Jesus has the right to overrule it but it will be completely disappearing in the full restoration marvelous very good you know it's sad when people have no hope any funeral, you wonder, is this the end? What now? Well, the Bible gives answers. But outside the Bible, there are no answers. I know about people that say that they have these near-death experiences and they come back with these fantastic stories. The only problem is they come back with the stories, so they didn't die. And what value might this have? Ancestor worship so common amongst a lot of uh, developing countries and, and religions is false 
because it's based on the immortality of the soul. And talk about the immortality of the soul. I, I want you to see something. Have a look at this. It's the Catholic view, and it came from the Lateran Council in 1513, because some of the reformers were contesting the immortality of the soul. Now, you'd say, but their churches that they founded also believe in the immortality of the soul. That is true, but you read some of the writings of quite a few, quite a number, including Martin Luther, on the understanding of the state of the dead, their followers did not adhere to that. And I wouldn't have the time to quote every, every reformer, but let me just quote the position of the Roman Catholic Church, still held today. I want you to understand that. Whereas some have dared to assert concerning the nature of the reasonable soul, which they believe you have, a soul is something you have, the Bible teaches the soul is what you are. The body, with the breath of life, the force of life, becomes a living soul. That's biblical. But out there, even amongst Christendom, there is this belief that the soul is an immortal component of your makeup. And that is not what the Bible teaches. Catholicism does erroneously teach that. Concerning the nature of the reasonable soul that is mortal, we, they say, notice, with the approbation of the sacred council, you know, they believe that they have the infallible capacity of making this observation, to condemn and reprobate all those who assert that the intellectual soul is mortal. This goes directly against the Bible directly against scripture. It continues like this. Seeing according to the canon of Pope Clement V, note what he said, that the soul is immortal and we decree that all who adhere to like erroneous assertions, like that the soul, the human soul, is not immortal, shall be shunned and punished as heretics. Two things terribly wrong with that statement. First, it is erroneous, it's against the Bible. It leaves the door open to spiritualism. No question about it. But should you condemn, should you persecute, should you execute people who don't believe your doctrine, who won't accept that? God never told us to kill off and torture those who did not adhere to the biblical teaching. But this institute took it upon itself to do so. Let me put it to you this way. Imagine if this church, the Roman Catholic Church, would have understood, would have fully understood correctly the state of the dead. Imagine. Imagine. Forget about eternal hellfire, wouldn't you? Because it wouldn't exist. In fact, in fact, the philosophy of eternal hellfire is really a pagan belief found its way into the medieval church who used it to its own designs and pursuits and in fact in fact also even introduced this state of between non-existence and hell called purgatory where you would suffer as so much until you were purified and fit for heaven that Philosophy is still there. It leaves the door open. It leaves the door open to spiritualism. And let me put it to you this way. The teachings that God would put you into a position of incredible torture. I think what could be more torturous than to be burning continuously and not dying. Never to find any relief of pain, not just for a certain period of time, no, for eternity. That is the greatest lie and the greatest accusation against God. And it's a terrible one. I, when I was brought up with this belief that I just showed you, I could not love a God who is capable of inflicting such tremendous 
tremendous torture forever and ever and ever and ever. I couldn't. But thanks heavens, the Bible says it's not true. These are all lies. In today's world, we would say fake news. Well, there's a lot of fake news about the Bible. That is true. But why do so many of the Protestant churches adopt this cruel belief? Why do they do that? Spiritualism is based on the misunderstanding, the misconception of what a human soul really constitutes, what really is. And the immortality of the soul lays the foundation for spiritualism, which we know even from the book of Revelation will be so prevalent in the closing scenes of this planet. Very prevalent. The true state of the dead. Well, people say, well, what about the witch of Endor who brought Samuel out of the ground? Let me tell you something. Samuel was a great man of God. How can this story reflect the true state of the dead? How could it do there in 1 Samuel? How could that be true? Because let's face it, Samuel, a good man who died, should have gone then straight to heaven, shouldn't he? But he didn't come down from heaven. He came up from the earth. Were the dead supposed to were in pagan beliefs? has nothing to do with the state of the dead. Then there is the other story in defense. You remember the story of poor Lazarus and the rich man and, and, the, and the man who wouldn't want to share anything with poor Lazarus. And, and then you, then you, and I would recommend that you read this particular story in Luke the 16th chapter. When you look at it, you'll have a scenery where God doesn't even feature in the account. Jesus doesn't even feature. Apparently it's Abram who decides what can and what cannot be done, which was the misconception of the Jews, of their understanding of the state of the dead that was already so distorted from the biblical realities and truth. And Jesus met them on their own erroneous ground to make to them known a more important principle which they didn't really get after all. The rich man and poor Lazarus is not the state of the dead. Jesus said many things to say. I'll quote you. I will quote you a number of statements. Let's go to Solomon. The living know that they will die. True? Yes. But the dead know how much? Well, the dead know nothing. They know nothing. He goes on to say, their love, their feeling, their hatred, their envy, uh, they're all gone. Nobody who has passed away is angry. That's true. But they're not happy either. They're dead. There's no consciousness. Never more will they have, notice, never more will they have a share in anything that's done under the sun. Now, you have been to funerals where the, where the, the clergy kindly says, so-and-so is now in a better place. The bliss of heaven. I never could buy that. Or so-and-so that has passed away is looking down on us. No, they're not. They have passed on. They know nothing. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 5. They'll have nothing to do That's anything that's done under the sun. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was. This talks about the body. The spirit, the force of life, the life force that was added to the body there in Genesis 1 and 2. And the spirit will return to God who gave it. And, 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 and Ecclesiastes 3 verse 19 explains it so well. For what happens to the Son of Man also happens to animals. One thing befalls them both. As one dies, so dies the other. And know this, surely they all have one breath. Man has no advantage, no advantage over the animals. So all his pursuers are vanity. In other words, at the point of death, the force of life goes to the life giver. That is even, that's true of the saved and the unsaved. All life force returns to God, including the life force forces of the animals. All life that has been given goes back to the life giver. That is what the Bible teaches. Book of Psalms. Book of Psalms. David. 
3,000 years ago. Do not put your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, or in whom there is no help. Uh, that's an ordinary man. His spirit departs, the force of life. He returns to the earth, the body does. In the very days, his plans perish. What can he do for you? Nothing. Nothing. This is what Jesus taught about the state of the dead. Do not marvel at this, he said, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the grave, that is all, any of them, the good and the bad, ultimately, all of them, hear his voice and come forth. Now, we know some of the first resurrection, others in the second. But Jesus raises up every person back from the dead. Satan raises up none, zills, none. It is all down to God who is the life giver and returns life when he sees fit. Who hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil, obviously, to the resurrection of condemnation. We just talked about that. Here, have a look at a statement like this. This is the will of my Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing or nobody, uh, but should raise it up, him or her, raise it up at when? The last day. That is the day when he returns. We all understand that. Note this statement. And this is the will of him who sent me, his Father's will, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him and has, will have everlasting life. Because if they have died, he says, I will raise him or her up at the, yes, the last day. Here's another statement. No one can come to me. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me has drawn him or her and I will raise him or her up on the last day. And then one more statement on this issue. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood, that all precisely is spiritual sense, has eternal life and I will raise him, I will raise her up on the last day. Jesus teaches us a resurrection on the last day at his return. That is for all those that are in him. Why do we get it so horribly wrong in all the other churches? Why do they persist in their error? This is what he said. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I would have told you. Note this. I go to prepare a place for you. This is the new Jerusalem, you know. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, well, what's the purpose of preparing a place? Note this, note this. Uh, I will come again. I will come again. He is preparing the place for you. What is the point? What is the point? You being dead here, him preparing a place there. It only, it only serves a purpose if he comes again, he comes again and he receives, note the language, he receives us and receive you to myself. Who is receiving who? Well, Christ comes in the air and he receives us. Gravity will lose its power on us and we will join him in the air with all the resurrected ones if we are the ones that are alive when he returns. I would have thought the Bible is so plain, so straightforward on this. And those institutions, those denominations who are incorrect should correct their belief. He says that where I am, there you may be also. That's the purpose. Now let's go back to the book of Revelation. Now, when the thousand years have expired, let's go back, chapter 20. Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations. Gog and Magog. Who are Gog and Magog? In principle, uh, you find the expression in the book of Ezekiel, in principle, these are the entities against God. Let's just uh, describe them like that. So those who were against God, to gather them together to a battle, there is going to be a battle, that's amazing, whose number is at the sand of the sea. Now, now you've got to understand. 
We have about 7.3 billion people on the planet right now. How many people have ever lived? I don't know, 50, 60, 70 billion in all up? When Jesus returns, most will be lost. Sad, but yeah, it's a reality. Now think of all the billions of people that are brought back at the, simultaneously to life, congregating together. And Satan will be moving amongst them. He will claim that he brought them back. That's what he will claim. Now they don't come up with an immortal perfect body. No, no, they, they will have their imperfections and whatever else they suffer from. But, but Satan will make them believe that he can do everything for them. That he is the true prince of this world. You know, you want to read the book, The Great Controversy, uh, by Alan G. White. I would recommend you would read that and look at the descriptions. And so, and so they went up on the breath of the earth. They did. This is, all, this is all looked at 95 AD, at the end of the first century. He is looking ahead for, for at least, or about 2,000 years, or at, in fact it is more than that because we have the ad, the millennium. So he's looking ahead 3,000 years, if you like. And he sees that they surround the camp of the saint. What is that? Well, the beloved city. The New Jerusalem. Where does the New Jerusalem come from? Now for that we have to go to the next chapter, which we will study next week. The New Jerusalem comes out of heaven after the thousand years. Not at the beginning of the thousand years, after the thousand years. That is the metropolis that in which the, the, the saved and, and the redeemed are dwelling. Tremendous study. You should, you should really make sure you see that next week. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. In other words, we have a verification of the justice of God's decision. Satan will only do what he can do. Deceive, mislead, perpetrate violence, lies misrepresentation and those who are deceived those who are deceived will be all those who come up in the second resurrection only to be willing to be deceived again they were not safe to be saved and that affirms the justice and the righteousness of God the dead it says here the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. That whole story that Satan will have the privilege of making people the lost suffer through eternity by keeping the fires going is a cruel hoax. Because the Bible says that Satan, the devil, will be thrown into the fire. He comes to an end. And I can quote you a number of texts in the Bible that tells us so. Why believe in an eternal hellfire where Satan will, will, will to his heart's content, torture the people? What a cruel doctrine. Always the consent of God. The Bible speaks against that. Where the beast and the false prophet are. Now you remember that, the ones of Revelation 13 where they were cast is perhaps the better translation, where the beast and the false prophet were cast. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So is that a basis of believing that torture will be forever? No, no, the basis here is the effect will be forever. The Greek word aeonius means for an age until it is all burned. Whatever is combustible will be burned. And that would be in harmony with other statements in the Bible. And I'll quote you some in a minute. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. You cannot escape 
the judgment of God. If there's one thing you should remember, please, you cannot, you cannot escape the judgment of God. That's what the Bible teaches. And I saw the dead, and John is addressing it. It doesn't matter what happened to you. He'll find you. He knows where you are. I saw the dead, great and small, standing before God, and the books were opened. It's a, the evidence will be presented. Another book was opened, of course, which is the book of life. Now, just to make sure, if your name is not in the book of life, you are going to be lost, you're going to be destroyed, you are not coming up in the wrong resurrection, you book, your name is not in the book of life, you come up in the second resurrection. And the dead were judged according to their works, their choices. By the things which were written in the book, we are accountable. And then it goes on like this. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. And death and hate. Hades is not hell. It really is the Greek word for uh, the grave. Sheol in the Hebrew is exactly the same, often translated as hell. It doesn't mean that at all. It means the grave. So death and the grave delivered up the dead that were in them, and they were judged. That is what it teaches. Each according to his works. Then death and Hades, that is the, the grave, were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Death will die a death, I suppose. What the Bible is saying, it won't exist anymore. It won't be there anymore. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire, a cleansing fire, and then I'd like to quote to you from Malachi, who lived about 400 BC, probably wrote this in about 410, 420 BC, somewhere around this area, commenting on this, what we are studying. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all the proud, all who do wickedly will be stubble. That's what he said. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts. Notice, notice, that will leave them neither root nor branch. The root of all the evil and death is Satan. He will be destroyed as well. And all of his followers, and then he says this, he says, you shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet, on the day that I do this, the elements of the bodies of the lost will be back into the ground as the dust, being part of the dust and on which you will walk. It becomes part of the soil. Amazing statement. For they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day I do this, says the Lord of hosts. Long before Revelation was written, in summary, a thousand years, the close of probation. Remember the seven last plague. They only fall on the enemies of God's people. And then we have the second coming. Satan will be bound for a thousand years. The righteous dead are resurrected at the second coming. The righteous living are transformed at the second coming. And we're all going to heaven. The wicked living... Well, they are destroyed at his coming and will not even be buried. The wicked dead, well, they remain in the grave and they know nothing of this event. They miss out altogether. Now at the end of the thousand years, when Satan has been bound for a thousand years, there is a second resurrection of the wicked. Satan will be back in business. He will be employed again for a brief time. The new Jerusalem, as you will see in the study of next week, comes down from heaven. Satan deceives the nations, as he always has. The wicked, listening to him, uh, by force will try to take the city. Fire comes down from heaven. The wicked are destroyed. That's the second death, including Satan who will be destroyed. And this death 
there is no resurrection. That is the story. Next week, uh, you'll like this one. The New Jerusalem. We'll get the details. Streets, solid gold. Amazing. Solid gold, pure gold, like transparent glass. That's the New Jerusalem. And also, also, I will... I will tell you the size of the New Jerusalem because I get it from the Bible. If you project it on, on known territories geographically today, you can have an... Look at this. If you put that over the, the United States or in the Middle East, look at the size of the New Jerusalem. It is a metropolis of such an extraordinary size. You know, I know it's all sometimes hard to believe, but... Everything that the Bible has predicted and taught has been come to pass. And so the details of where you will be going, if you hang on to Christ and you let him lead you, you're going to see all this. You're going to be a part of all this. And why wouldn't you? Surely you wouldn't want to miss out. Looking forward to your company next week. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we had the privilege again to study your word, the amazing promises, the amazing sayings, and all true, because it is your word. And so as we, as we go through this week, I ask that you help us, that you strengthen us, encourage us, and that you may bring to mind the incredible future that you have laid apart for us. Lord, help us to make it to be there, to be with you and to be a part of the wonderful plans that you have made for us. Bless us now and keep us near to your heart in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You've been listening to Revelation Ancient Prophecy with Pastor Baron Neustraten, brought to you by 3ABN Australia Radio. For more information on this series, visit waitarachurch.org.au. From 3ABN's album, Pillars of Our Faith, Volume 2, this is Jesus, We Crown You Praise. The first time you came, they crowned you with thorns, as on an old rugged cross you were raised. But the next
folks, today I'd like to share with you one of my poems entitled Keep Speaking to Me. My name is William Ackland. Today is just the kind of day, O oh Lord, I would have ordered if I could. The temperature's just right, the sky is blue, there's a few white clouds for contrast, but the best thing of all, you spoke to me, and I have responded in kind. So keep speaking, Lord, keep talking to me. I'll keep what you say in my mind. I'll keep all that you say to me, dear Lord, for the things you tell me are good. The more you say, the happier I'll be, for what you tell me will last. It is not the same as a man would say, for your words are truly divine. I'll keep listening, Lord, as you talk to me. Another good page in my mind. Another page in the story of life and of the way my life should go. On the way from here to the world beyond, the world that is tinted with gold. The best thing of all each day, O oh Lord, I hear when you tell me my goals. A goal to aim for, a destiny for me, a home with the saints of all time. Along this road that I'm walking now, as I read these pages again. Yes, I'll listen, dear Lord, as you speak to me. I'll recall it all if I can, for I know your word will bless all my days. All through my life, they will last. They'll last for as long as this world will last and into the future ahead. So keep talking to me, dear Father God. Keep speaking to me while I'm here. And this child of yours will praise you each day as you change my heart and my mind. You've been listening to a production of 3ABN Australia Radio.